Animiz, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I've been really excited by, about this. It was Rachel Spawn from a previous episode that linked us up and got us, got us on. But um, thank you so much for, for coming on. Pleasure. Thank you for having me and for your tolerance in finding a time that works. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is totally acceptable because uh, you're a new mum. And, yes. Um, how are we were talking about the joys of um, lack of sleep. <laughs> yeah. uh, how are you getting on with it like how how are you finding it it's a new challenge i imagine yeah definitely a new challenge um when i first had evelyn i thought i coped really well with the lack of sleep and she started to sleep exquisitely through the night and we hit the four to five month age period where sleep regresses a little bit and um it's like i, I had a taste of sleep and now she's taken it back and it's really brutal i understand why it's a torture technique sleep deprivation <laughs> yeah. um but we had a good night last night so I, i've got a bit more energy which is great yeah i imagine it's just full of ups and downs um i think that's the one thing i'm not looking forward to when i become parent that sleep deprivation that's for sure <laughs> honestly it's probably the hardest part but there are so many joyous moments like i, I get to dress her up the highlight of my day is picking out <laughs> some clothes for her and and when she has a bad night i dress her exceptionally pretty just to you know yeah Remind me, yet she's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. <laughs> um, look, I I was saying how I've now been in Adelaide in in Australia, and I've been in um sort of I guess where I've been living is sort of suburban area. But you came from mm -hmm. the country in yes. Australia, so I, I'd love to talk about sort of what it was like experiencing growing up in the country, and then your journey of how you got into cycling and and sort of how you managed dealing those big those big journeys and and uh and what it was like yeah absolutely i uh i grew up in a small coal mining town called middlemount in central queensland um right in the bowen basin um uh, my father was a coal miner for 38 years 35 years um my mother was the bus driver so she took the miners to and from work um on their shifts uh she was also you know the mum of four children i'm the baby of the Mears family and quite simply, her rule was that she wouldn't have four kids participate in four different sports. So, because <laughs> <laughs> she just didn't have the time to offer. Um, so we either got ourselves to the sports um, or the oldest had the right to choose the sport that all the kids did. And we have one boy in the family who's the oldest and three girls. So often it was my big brother who chose sports that all these little sisters participated in. Um, he dragged us through sports like BMX, karate, um, tennis, triathlon, cross country, really all your school-based sports we did. Um, but because we grew up in the country, really the other rule that mum had was if the sun is up, you can be out of the house and be back by the time the sun is down. So we went on adventures all the time from, you know, if it rained, which was a rare occurrence, we would run through puddles all day. Um, we would build cubbies in the bush um, we'd climbed the the one mountain that was one kilometre long in town. Um, yeah, really just busy ourselves. We were always outdoors, always active. And um, in 1994, after my oldest siblings, Scott and Tracy, moved out of home, Kerry and I were watching the Commonwealth Games on TV and we saw track cycling and that was when Cathy Watt won gold for Australia. And um, having been dragged through... BMX and having our bush bashing bikes, which we love to, you know, thrash around town on. Um, this new form of riding a bike was quite intriguing. Um, so we asked mum and dad if we could try it. Um, they had no idea where they were going to find it. So they just flipped through the yellow pages for the closest cycling club. And that was in Mackay, um, nearly three hours drive from where we lived. Wow. And um, you'd think most parents would kind of say to their 11 and 12 year old daughters, yeah, may maybe we'll try something a bit closer to home. But <laughs> Um, my parents drove us in one weekend for us to just try the sport. We borrowed a bike, we borrowed a helmet, um, and we fell in love with it. And now here I am some 26 years later as equally the most successful woman in the world at that, at that sporting discipline. It's, it's unreal. And I think sometimes you, unless you're in Australia, you really don't understand like the scale of distance between some of the towns that are there like yes. and well, germany and then, fits in queensland which was my home state yeah um, that's so insane, it's a good indication it? yeah 
And and I've got, I mean, I'm coaching kids and they talk about like when they they come from miles away, um, especially over here in, in Adelaide, and you're like, you, you, you just sometimes can't actually comprehend that the it's the commitment to it then. Then you realize it's not necessarily just the 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 skill that they're doing, it's the commitment and mm. it's mad like it's such a big distance <laughs> it's such a yeah. big distance. i'm not used to it from like in the uk it's like oh it's 20 minutes or 30 minutes down the road you might get a couple of buses and stuff like that but you'll be there within an hour but like three hours like that is um that's a trek that's a proper trek and yeah like you said, and it's you, go on go on sorry it's it's not just like a challenge for me and my sister who were having fun every weekend when we got to mm. get to that end point it was a commitment from mum and dad who every weekend their own social lives were sacrificed to drive us in um they worked longer hours to pay for because cycling's not a cheap sport and mm. um being the ages we were we were growing constantly so every time we had a growth spurt we needed a new bike we needed new shoes need helmets clothes like i did not in any capacity fully appreciate the burden of our sport on our parents until i retired and um, I spent a lot more time with my parents and they've actually opened up to, you know, just the simple facts. Like they only planned on two kids. They ended up with four and the third and fourth chose a very expensive sport. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and you know, my parents' goal was to give our, give their kids every opportunity to find a passion. And they just happened to stumble on one of the most expensive ones that can come along. <laughs> yeah. And it, and that's a serious commitment from them like that to, to, literally because they were they would have had their own essential goals and dreams and things they wanted to achieve and when you have kids like that like you put it i guess i didn't really appreciate what my my parents had done in my professional career until till i i finished as well and you're like wow like the saturdays the weekend the week you think how much people want their weekends right like whether you're a child like how much they love their weekends so then your weekend is spent moving your child or children mm to a sport and especially if it's miles away that's yeah they they need much more applause and gratitude than they probably ever ever get um parents it's probably a good wonderful. indication um of the, the role they played being so well if you as a child weren't aware of their sacrifice and hard work yeah that's a really good point isn't it yeah if you're not aware yeah. of it then then it's probably not being burdened on you if, at all either that's um, exactly that's another great great attribute for them um, so yeah, you said your sister getting into cycling as well, and she ended up become pretty good. And and I found that interesting. You were talking about it being an expensive sport. You must have been in an era when like technology was changing in in um, cycling quite a lot and quite rapidly, because it's there's always a new bike, there's always a carbon fiber frame, there's always new uh, aerodynamics, there's something coming out. You must have been right in a boom of that happening. Um, yeah, well, I went from riding with toe clips to strapless pedals. I went from the the down tube gear change to the STI levers um, on the road, just stuff like that. Um, I had aluminium second hand frames until I was under nineteen, um, and I only got a carbon fr frame because my big sister Carrie, as you said, was also in the sport and very successful. Um, but she was much more successful from an early age. So she got the better equipment. And once she grew out of it, I could get her stuff. <laughs> Hand me downs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't get my first bike firsthand to me until I was um, 20 years of age. Um, and I saved my pocket money like, yeah, for years to afford that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, like you said, Kerry was successful. Mm. So as you're growing up, I had a younger I had a younger brother. Um, you were the younger sibling. We had a great rivalry growing up, and I know what that sibling rivalry is like. What was it like for you, um, trying essentially chasing your your older sister? Well, it was nothing different for me. I always did that. <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, whether it was the last bit of food on the table, winning you know hands, shotgun of the car, front seat of the car, top bunk at home. Like we were battling and and uh, competing against each other always. Um, so it, it was no different for me. Um, I think the difference came when Kerry was quite successful, quite young, um, and it took me a while to physically develop. Um, mm -hmm. And when I started to contest and take wins off Kerry, then we had to deal with this external presence of newspaper articles and um, opinions um, around that. And that was tougher on her. You know, she really was 
that person that created that umbrella of protection for me because she absorbed a lot of that early and I was able to witness um, her ab absorbing and experiencing that early. Um, and when you do get the chance to watch someone go through something like that, you learn by their experiences. So, Do you think that's the pressure of being the older sibling? Do you think that's the pressure from people saying like you've got a younger sibling chasing you and how are you like, I guess the limelight, uh, I guess the, not limelight, the um, natural perception would be that the older sibling should be like the stronger, the better, the, is that what we're talking, is that what you're kind of talking about as in that, that was a pressure that was on? Yeah, I think, I think it was only a pressure because it was done on a stage where people could see, mm. you know, when, when it's just in the family unit at home, it's, you know, a bit of a noogie here, a bit of a wedgie there and you know, you pick yourself up and, and try again next time. Um, but when it's being reported and people start having conversations around you um, about, oh, she's coming or she's catching you, you know, it, it's, it compounds already um, high pressure, stressful environment. And, um, and, and when you're young, that can be really difficult to have to comprehend and deal with. And um, yeah, we, we, we both feel we did the best we could with what skills we had at the time. Yeah. Put us, put us back there now, we would handle it very differently because we've, we've been through very different life experiences now and we would be able to handle those things differently. Um, but I'm just grateful that, that she has always stayed so true to herself. She's, you know, bigger siblings are always a bit protective too. Younger siblings don't care. <laughs> we just, <laughs> we want the best of everything. Like give yeah. it to me type thing. Um, if not, I'll work hard to take it. And that's what, that's what my mentality was like. And it was very different from Carrie's being the bigger protective sister. Do you, you said you reckon you'd handle it differently. Do you think something like, social media would play a big role in no. maybe because there'd be there'd be there's far more pressure on young athletes as well where, where in the sense that there's so much access to information and and stories and stuff like that if would, i think you there's a lot more different? pressure on parents now with social media as well wow, um, yeah. not just um in helping the youngsters deal with an added element of of platform mm. that people have access to their kids but also um, the associated judgments that come with that on parenting ability as well. Um, social media for me never really came into the picture until the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Um, you know, in Athens in 04, I still had the, the phone home scratchy card where you had to get the pin number, <laughs> you know, to dial into the landline to make a call home. I had the pocket, pocket mail that I had to put to the headset to send my emails, you know, that sort of stuff. Wow. I didn't have a laptop. I didn't have a mobile um with a smartphone face anything like that so uh in some ways i miss those days yeah wow yeah, yeah. that's um it that's interesting you talk about parents like because i spoke to rachel in the the um podcast we did about parenting and and what it was like um for her being a parent and also how she felt being a parent uh, having been parented as an as an athlete and it is something that i see as a either the greatest um, asset to some young athletes in their progression, but also the greatest burden sometimes, depending on how personal parents take it, they can take yeah. it seriously personal. Um, you, you hit it on the head. It's not just them taking it personally, but sometimes um, without knowing, they can impart their own desires for their children that they missed out on themselves mm. um, and, and almost... Um, lose the opportunity for their, their their youngsters to find their own passion and and experience of dedication and commitment for the passion um that yeah. they found rather than feeling like they owe owe mum and dad and, and i don't want to have my young daughter who's only five months of age ever feel like she owes me um i i feel like i want to work because i owe her yeah and, and sports so brutal in the sense that if you the failure needs to be a part of it you need to have failure and, and and if that doesn't if you if the parent is not willing to see their child fail then oh that it's a uh, again it's taken personally that whole feedback loop that happens when you're trying to actually progress at something just is held back and it's it's 
it's I, I say it's toxic like it can be toxic um, it, it absolutely can um and and again it's it's how you look at any situation i see sport as a really valuable and great vehicle uh, to teach um success and loss and mm -hmm. failure and challenge and adversity um you know i'm i'm equally the most successful woman in the world i've won 11 world titles in my career it means I've won more than anyone else has ever experienced in my sporting discipline. Um, but what most people don't know is I've lost more than I've won in my mm -hmm. time as well. You know, I've lost a further 29 attempts to be a world champion. Um, so my success rate is actually pretty low <laughs> when you yeah. start looking at percentages in that capacity. But then everyone underneath me um, has has that that ratio gets smaller and smaller and smaller. That's how, how hard it is to be number one. and how often we actually experience loss and failure as opposed to success, winning and celebration. Yeah, I, I imagine there's some losses that you felt along the way that would have triggered probably more drive in you. Um, oh, but yeah. actually, yeah, <laughs> we'll get onto those. But I wanted to actually talk about when you probably first felt success. So mm. when you first, is there a memory or something that you reckon triggered you to go in, oh, I like that? Yeah, success. I, I want a bit of that. That's what I want. Yeah, it was the junior world titles in uh, Trexler Town, America. I was um, just uh, 17, 16, turning 17 years of age. It was my second year as a junior. Uh, what most people don't know about our sport or my sport is that you have to be a minimum age of 19 to compete internationally at a senior level. Mm -hmm. um, and so the junior ranks come under that. Um, I won the world 500 meter time trial um, after coming 10th the year before. And that was the first time I kind of thought to myself, maybe just maybe I can make something out of this sport. I never vocalized that I wanted to go to the Olympic games. I was very, very um, guarded on my goals because I didn't want to deal with the judgment of other people's perception of my failure if I didn't achieve those goals. I just wanted to have that ability for myself. And I, I kept that right through my career. You know, I didn't even share with my family what my goals were for my last Olympic Games in Rio. It just was just for me to judge what my success was because I knew that everyone else was going to have their own levels of, of what success was. And by that stage, it was gold medal. So <laughs> <laughs> I needed to keep keep real and honest with myself. And I've been like that. So it would have been 16, 17. Um, it was, the year was 2000 and yeah, 2001, I think it was in Trexler town, junior world 500 time trial winner. That's really interesting that you, you kept it to yourself sometimes. Mm. So it's, it's, it's real. I mean, it's so different for each, each person I've ever met that has had success in different areas. Um, I personally was one that actually verbalized what I what I would want and wanted to achieve, like, right, I want to be a professional cricketer. And for me, verbalizing it was like, now I've written a binding contract. <laughs> I'm, I'm now committed to it. And if there was ever a moment when I couldn't or, or didn't want to uh, do something and it was, it was really tough, then I would remember that sort of like verbal binding contract. But yeah, I've heard, and even then, like you said, ho holding it internally, um, how, did, how did you then, did you get any people outside of you sort of like constantly asking you what do you want to achieve yeah. what do you want to get <laughs> yeah, what, yeah what do you want from this um yeah how can you get how do you, where do you want to go how do you want to get better how did you manage that i i started to navigate who in my team because firstly i learned that i couldn't do it on my own um who in my team i needed to help me achieve those goals mm. and it was with those people that I did share the goals so that I could help, get some help to work out the stepping stones to make them happen. So my coach was big. Um, my manager was big. Um, and sometimes I would share with my family, not the, the specific, a specific detail goal, but it would be, yeah, I'm going to, I want to go to these Olympic games. I, to get there, I need to go to these competitions and to get to those competitions, I need to do these training sessions. I need this amount of sleep you know, the detail can get quite extensive. Yeah. Um, but for Rio, it was just my coach, Gary West, and my manager, Francine Pinnock. Um, there was a time where my coach tried to get the team, as in the sprint team that I was a part of, 
to share with each other what our goals were for the Olympics. And I flat refused to do so because I was still competing with some of the women in that team. And that was not safe for me in any capacity to engage at that level with them. Um, and I, I remember that I um, caused a little bit of a stir in refuting to engage in that way with the team. Um, I worked on team goals, absolutely. Um, but individually, uh, I was more reserved to the people that I knew could help me make it happen. That was Con- that's that, that's really that that's um that's so fascinating that because it is a team. I think people forget that team sprint is a team effort. Like it's mm-hmm. a it's a team effort. So you you sitting there refusing now to uh, uh I'm not going to tell you what I want to do. I'm not going to tell you that did did it cause conflict and tension within the team? It made it difficult for my coach to encourage the other athletes to share their goals. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and so he kind of talked to me on the on the side to uh, to gauge what why um, I was holding back. Um, but really, I was more than happy to help other people. But I just knew how I worked. I I knew what I needed to make that success happen. Um, and even though those were individual goals there was a large number of people included to make those happen. Um, it didn't include the athletes I was competing against. Mm, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, And I think again, with a sport like cycling, people can think of it being very much, you're just the only, the, the person that's on the bike is, is the main driving force of everything, but there's so much going on behind it. And uh, absolutely. Well, at, at the end of the day, you know, the coach lets you go at the start line and it is you against an opponent, for example, me and Vicky Pendleton at the, the final, the London Olympics or um, a standing 500 meter time trial. It's prior to that moment that the teamwork has to um, come together or come to the fore because without the buy-in to the work, um, understanding the strategies, the skill acquisition along the way, being able to communicate um, and function as a team, the execution at the end of the day doesn't happen. Um, mm. even though what people tune in to see every four years is an individual performance. Um, mm. It's very much a team team role. I mean, I work with a staffing unit between 30 and 40 members um, and each of them are experts in their field. I can't be an expert as a mechanic, as a sports scientist, as a biomechanic, as a coach, as a statistician, as a skill acquisition specialist, as a media analyst, as a manager. Like the list goes on for the professions it takes for, for one athlete to be successful. I can't be across all those for me to be no. an executive, to be a professional in my role. So trusting those people in those positions is important so that you can communicate and be honest. And, and like I said, have the buy into the strategies that you create um, and also understanding how each person operates and, and learns as well, because um, information is, you know, can be blanket if you don't understand what it is they're trying to get you to do. With, with um, trusting your team, uh, like I said about the whole technology of cycling moving all the time and improving, I imagine they constantly were coming to you with new ideas, new things to do, um, new tactics. Was there anything that you did that you, you yes, there, when there's new information coming in, did you just take it all in all the time and try it out? Or were there things that you stuck by because they'd got you to where you, you were? Sort of processes or routines um, things that were like regular for you? Uh, I had to learn over time that change was important um, to adapt to change, but also accept change in order to be successful over a long period of time, especially in a sporting competitive environment, not just do your competitors change, but um, your strengths and weaknesses can be assessed and analysed by your opponents and worked out. So you've got to constantly be honest with the person in the mirror looking back at you as to what you're good at and what you're not good at um, in order to continually change and upskill yourself to be competitive. Um, And for me, change was always hard because I'm a creature of habit. I like routine. I like structure. Um, I like knowing what I know. What I don't know scares me because it takes me out of my comfort zone. Uh, And so my team spent a lot of time teaching me how to be uncomfortable or comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm. Um, And that was really important, especially for London, because coming up against Vicky Pendleton, who was 
the best in the world. She, she'd been undefeated internationally for six years. She wasn't going to get worse. <laughs> I, I had to take the onus on learning how to be better. Um, and, and often it's a frustrating process because, um, firstly, you have to be honest. Secondly, you have to break old habits in order to learn new ones so that when you're performing in an environment that is hugely under pressure with high expectation and stress, your auto default mode of action has to be practiced. And it's those practiced habits that need to be, um, you know, just done in small patterns every single day. And if you're practicing bad habits that don't help you in competition, they will come to the fore um, under pressure. So it's, it's almost those um, idiosyncrasies of normalcy you can create on a daily training platform that you will come to lean on very heavily in an abnormal environment like the Olympic Games. Yeah, that's definitely a, that initial part of honesty, being honest, like is what I'm doing right now going to get me to where I want to be? If I continue doing the same things I've been doing, I'm, I'm not going to change. Nothing's going to be different. And that that breaking out of that current situation is so hard. Like I, I've seen people do it before and, and I've done it and it's it's painful because you don't try you you have nothing to gauge it by before. Like you're going into the unknown. But yeah, if you can change those little things day by day, you'll um it'll all add up. It will definitely, definitely, definitely add up. Um so you have got to Athens 2004 where you won gold medal. And I we'd spoken about um adversities and failures and you had a pretty massive one in 2008 with your neck injury um is there much you remember about that day when you hurt your neck and you hurt yourself and and the injury yeah i i remember um it was the final day of competition at the los angeles world cup and for beijing there were five qualification races this um world cup was the third um, the Kieran was not an Olympic event, but it was a world championship event. So it was still important for me uh, to contest that final um, and get a good result. Uh, my sister was there at that World Cup as well. She was in the minor final. Um, so she was in the race prior to me. Uh, my coach, Martin Barras, came to me and, you know, like you do before every final, you talk strategy, you talk um in depth and, and he said to me like that we're seven months from the games the last thing we need are any accidents or injuries which is notoriously common in kirins because of the close nature uh, of racing the speeds that we go um and the amount of people that are on the track in a final which is you know can be anywhere from six to nine um on that day was six and um and he just said that we we talked about the different um expectations of what different riders would do and he basically said, if you get swamped, um, go to the back, give yourself plenty of space um, and make as late and fast a move as around the outside as possible. And that's exactly what happened. Two laps to go, I got passed from the left to the right. There were elbows, there were knees. Um, so I decided that I'll put the handbrake on and give myself a good bike length, bike length and a half from the main um, jostling bunch. And um, with 250 metres to go, I remember it was time. I got out the saddle. I started to accelerate. I was doing at least 60k an hour by the time I came to pass the bunch. Um, there was movement in the bunch and my uh, ability to align the wheel, which we, we call aligning the wheel to make a move around the outside using the slingshot effect of drafting. Um, there was, it had moved. Um, I clipped the wheel and I honestly remember the first thought was, the, the the flight home and economy is really going to suck now because <laughs> it's it's tight at the best of times and I knew I was going to um, fall and be very sore. Um, I remember hitting the track with my head and and instantly feeling hungover, really really nauseous. I remember a blur of color, and and then it just goes black. Um, what that blur of color turns out was the the um, signage on the velodrome floor um going past my past my eyes at close proximity and um i then remember waking up on the duck board just just calling out to the medical team who were attending me at the time my neck my neck my neck um and then i went black again and i woke up as they were rolling me onto a stretcher purely because someone had put their hand on the 
on the friction burns I had on my leg and it stung like hell. I'm like, stop touching me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I, then I felt, you know, I hung over and wheezy for the rest of the trip and I thought they were fussing way too much and I was expecting just to go to the hospital, get checked over and, and be released to, to catch the flight home with the team uh, the next morning. Uh, but when the doctors came in at about oh, one o'clock, in the, the, so the final was at 5 p.m. And the, by the time all the testing had been done by 1 a.m., uh, they had found I had fractured my C2 vertebra, which is the second down from the skull, on top of a, a long list of physical injuries and um, would require a neck brace for a minimum of 10 weeks. So I, I just remember feeling very nonchalant but also shocked trying to compute the information because I didn't really know what broken neck meant. Like I'm like, I feel fine. I can feel my toes. I can feel my hands. I, I'm sore and I've got a headache, but what does, what does a broken neck mean? Um, and by the time I got to my room, I, I realized that my, my Olympic dream had probably gone out the window on, for the second occasion. But it hadn't though, had it? it you were yeah. literally no, <laughs> you were, so you were seven months away from the, the Olympics Mm -hmm. But you were back on the bike, what was it, two weeks later or something? Ten, ten days. Ten days later. Like, so what in that ten days, what happened? What, what was it that you were able to, to, say, to say to the doctors, to, to convince people that you, could, you were okay um, and then you were able to get um, back on and go? Was there any fear as well? Like, was there yeah, yeah, any fear going fear. back onto the bike? Yeah, so but firstly... Um, before my, my coach left with the team, cause I had to stay in hospital in America. Um, and my sister had to go home as well. Um, as I just said to him, I'll still be right for Beijing. <laughs> and I think he thought the morphine was talking cause, um, he kind of just patted my hand down. It's like, you know, don't worry about that for a moment. <laughs> um, and we pushed and we pushed and we pushed the medical team in America to get me home as quickly as possible. Um, so yeah, we were into PT work. We were into, um, making sure that I could get a flight. I had to fly home first class, which I was chuffed about. Like you never get to fly first class, like break a neck and you get to fly first class because then you get to fly, <laughs> um, lay flat. Um, and so we had to make sure that insurances were in place in order to cover both the medical costs, the flights, uh, DVT medications, pain medications, nausea medications that I had a carer that could tend to me for the whole time. Um, so I got home within seven days. Um, the takeoffs and landings were brutal on the mm. plane sitting upright. And by the time I got home, I was grateful that my coach had gone back to the team and said, right, this is she's what, she, what she wants. She still wants to make Beijing. Uh, the goalposts and the time frame hasn't shifted, uh, but the path that she has to walk now has. So how do we get her to Beijing? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and by the time I came home, they had a new plan for me. And uh, it simply started with getting back on the bike. Um, I was very gung-ho. Um, I was sick of people at this stage, even only a week after the fall, telling me what I couldn't do. I just wanted them to tell me what I could do and apply the brakes only when necessary. Um, so I was pretty driven. I was pretty stubborn in that regard. Um, and basically we trained from the toes up because the most damage was, was shoulders and neck. Um, so I could pedal, um, I could go to the pool and do some rehabilitation in the pool. And um, that took up the first month. Then I was allowed to go to the gym and start, you know, just doing basic things like sitting on a spin bike, go being placed into a leg press. Um, the coaches would add weight so I could just move my legs. By the time my legs was good, I could do core. By the time my core was strong, I could take my, my sling off, which I dislocated my shoulder and start doing upper body work. And by the time 10 weeks came, the neck brace came off and I could start getting some range of movement and treatment into um, both the muscle, muscle spasms that had locked up from protecting the bone damage, mm -hmm. but also working on um, movement of that bone damage. So um, the fear came in at about two weeks after the fall when I overheard a conversation between my coach and the, the doctors that I was actually two millimetres from a clean snap um, at the C2 level, which um, for those who don't know, C2 is very important mm -hmm. for breathing. That's where all your lung attachments go to. Um, and I remember just sitting at home with a fingernail on one millimetre and the other fingernail two millimetres down the ruler and just finally comprehending what two millimeters 
of life meant. <laughs> wow. Um, and that, that struck me with fear. Um, I was only 20, 23, 24 at the time. And I started to be very focused around the, the what if of situations. What if that two millimeters hadn't been there? Um, what if I had become a quadriplegic? Would I have been happy with my life? Do I still want to ride? Is it worth it? All those sort of big questions. And my coach just simply said to me, you're asking the right questions. Just change one word. <laughs> Don't ask yourself what if, ask what is. Because what if it, we're dri is driven by our fear and our doubts of what we don't want to have happen? Um, what if the two millimetres ha wasn't there? What if I get put in front of the goals, the team, and I miss the shot? What if I go for a job interview and I don't get the job? All those things haven't happened. But when we think in those contexts, often we can act in the same way that will drive us down that path. Whereas if in situational response, you think in the context of what is, you can only deal with the tangible, realistic information you have in front of you. And the what is of my situation was simply that the two millimeters saved my life. And that's a very different way you can look at the same situation. One being scared of the two millimeters and the other being thankful. Um, and once I realized that, my whole approach completely shifted. Um, and that seven month rehabilitation from the day I crashed and was put into a neck brace to the day I stood on the podium in Beijing to collect a silver medal um, was very much about that. Uh, I love that, that what is rather than what if. That's a, such a good thing that I think everyone can take a hold of. It doesn't even matter, that's not even applicable just in sport that's applicable and everything mm. that's um it's, it's amazing. that's beautiful really mm. so you you go to beijing obviously and this is where the rivalry with victoria pendleton is really really strong team gb had actually this was a very famous olympic games for them because they had that um sir dave brailsford had brought in the whole aggregation of marginal gains um i did a podcast actually funny enough with nick Littlehouse, who was the sports league coach with them and he was yeah. talking about that that whole process, and my God, that whole that whole world just seemed um, insane. And I've had I've had a friend who was in Team GB on the academy side. Um, Pete Mitchell did a podcast with him, and he was talking about Team GB's outlook around Beijing. And yeah, they were not messing around. But your your what was it like going into into that Olympics in Beijing with your rivalry with um, Victoria Pendleton? Because it was very very. Uh, public the mm, your, yeah. your whole rivalry and, it, and i don't think there's ever a conversation that i've had even with someone here in in australia that's you utter the word animism it's not far behind that someone mentions the the races so what was it like going into that beijing olympics obviously it was a silver medal for you but and in it and then also outside past it as well what, where was your mind at um well for beijing i i just was so desperate to be there. Um, I was scared of not delivering because my parents for the first time had forked out a lot of money to go. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, and I felt like I wanted to give them something as a reward for, for that money. Um, even though they never ever pressured or pushed for that. <laughs> mm. Um, I felt disappointed um in my final against vicky there because let's be honest she annihilated me in the final in beijing <laughs> <laughs> um and i crossed the line disappointed because it's that's the competitor in me you know you want to you want to make it a contest and i i didn't have the capability to do it you know um and it wasn't long until after i crossed the finish line still strapped into my bike that I realized what I feeling wasn't dis what I was feeling wasn't disappointment. It was utter relief. It was utter relief because I had finally crossed the finish line. I got a medal. I I had been so forward looking and forward thinking to be in that moment that I really hadn't done any prep for what happened after that moment. <laughs> mm. um, and so I I really was hit very hard by the emotions of it all um in Beijing and I realized that I could be so much better than I ever thought that I could as a result of that seven month period what I learned about myself um, and I knew that give me 
a chance to reapply those lessons in the next four years, I could turn the table. It was not going to be easy because it was going to be a home games for Vicky. Um, our rivalry was intense in that I started it. I, I caused a collision between the two of us and, and Vicky didn't um, take it well, didn't accept my apology, which I understand um, that I totally accept that. But there were moments um, past that where I felt that enough time had gone by to, to let it go. Um, mm. And we discussed this after Rio, actually. It was quite interesting um, in that I, I said to her, the moment that turned it for me was that in a, in a, a comment printed in the Australian paper in the 2010-11 season, she was quoted as saying her biggest rival she felt for London would be her Beijing runner-up in Guoshuang. And, and I thought to myself, hang on a minute, I, I'm your runner-up, not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked her, I said, did you actually say that or was that a, a misprint in the, in the media? And she goes, no, I, I did say it, but I didn't say it with the intention to piss you off. I was just so sick of people talking to me about you. I wanted to talk about someone else. <laughs> I, <laughs> and I said, well, isn't that funny? Because in the roundabout way, that's what actually pissed me off to go, I've, I've kind of, I call it, I've, I've said sorry, I've made a mistake. Um, now, I'm, now I'm coming, you know, to play 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 hard again so um that was the moment it all turned for me i found london really difficult because generally if you weren't cycling savvy and you were from the uk you hated me i was yeah. very villainized um i was coming to steal queen victoria's gold medals you know understand it completely yeah um there's sporting rivalry you throw in a britain and aussie um, you throw in a home turf for the Brits, like it's intense. Um, to the point where I landed in London at the customs desk and it takes a while to get your accreditation for the Olympic Games and handed over my paperwork, I handed over my passport and I was, you know, hi, yeah, great to be here for the Olympics, all that sort of stuff. And the guy, he looked at me, my passport, and his smile completely faded, right? And he looks up and he goes, you're, uh, you're Victoria's rival. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, I am. Um, he didn't talk to me for the rest of processing, not one word. And when he gave me back my paperwork and my passport, he said, uh, welcome to London. Enjoy your silver. And I was oh, like, wow. and I was just like, really? I, I didn't know how to take it. And I was so taken aback by it. I walked over to my team and they knew something was up because I was, I was a bit disoriented. And they were like, Mizzy, what's up? And I told them the story and they pissed themselves laughing. They thought it was the funniest thing. Like their reaction helped me cope with that because it doesn't take much. You can do all the physical prep, all the training prep in the world, but one person can drop a seed of negativity that can you know, grow exponentially and completely derail all that work, um, be it in your team or external to your team. And that was the moment for me that it could have all just fell apart. Um, so we go through, I don't have as good a games as I expect to leading into that final, not just me, but the whole Australian team. Our swim team has not delivered any gold medals. We've got three gold through the sailing program. Nothing's come out of athletics. Cycling is the next big thing um, that they expect results to come. We're on the last day of competition and we have no gold medals. We have no medals. And I meet Victoria Pendleton in the final of the sprint. She's already won the Kieran gold. I stuffed that up. I was the Kieran world champion. I end up fifth. So I'm carrying a bit of a heavy burden already of national pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's carrying, which I didn't realize the extent, but she's carrying national pressure as well. Prince Harry is in the stands. So Paul McCartney is in the stands. Like this is a spotlighted event. It, women's it sprinting has never been a spotlighted event. It was the most viewed uh, cycling race, I think, uh, at the time. It was. It was, was it? It was. Some, it was. Well, it was. I, I read up that it was either the the, the obviously the the most viewed um, female cycling race ever. Like ever. I remember, I, yeah. I literally remember tuning into it. I remember because the build up, like you said. Um, <laughs> Did you hate me? <laughs> but, well, I, I was sitting there going like. <laughs> Team GB are winning everything. This is awesome, and I I did get to go to London. I did get to go to the London Games, and I um t I mean tickets were crazy. It was such a great event. It was really d well done. I went to the basketball yeah, it was. The basketball arena. It, there were screens everywhere around the whole uh, Olympic Olympic like stadiums, and uh, Jason Kenny was 
riding that day and he won a gold or yes. and it might actually might have been the team sprint as well and just oh, look, you practically so, won everything <laughs> but the sound like and i wasn't even in the ve- the velodrome we, we weren't even there we were it was outside and it was just it was insane but i remember yeah, you, tuning into your race you talk about the sound the, the pretzel there is the first velodrome that i've competed in where the roof starts high and come it angles into the center of the track so all of the sound is angled towards the velodrome normally the roof is is concave so there's a lot more space for that sound to to kind of waste away um the decibel reading that was taken in the track that night of the final with me and victoria was 114 um a jet plane takes off at 120 so to have that concentrated (laughs) down towards you like i walked out my ears were bubbling i walked out that night like it took a while for my hearing to come back um but yeah we so the sprint final is a best of three matchup um, so you don't have to just beat your opponent once. You have to beat them twice in order to win. The first race, Vicky draws the front. Um, and it's, you know, perfect for me. I leave it there. I don't do anything to antagonize her. I don't want the speed to go high. So I do absolutely nothing to wind her up. And I lose the race by one one thousandth of a second. Now, if you don't know the distance of that time measurement, it is the width of a lead pencil line drawn on a piece of paper. Wow. So four years of preparation to lose a race by the width of a lead pencil line. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that there was a collision be- between us about 30 meters before the finish line. And when I came off the track, I said to my coach, I said, was there anything in that? I have no idea where, who was on the track. I just know we hit. And he goes, it doesn't matter. You lost the race, go back to the rollers, get ready for race two. I said, yeah, no worries. Um, by the time I get to the rollers, this booming voice comes over and says that, you know, Victoria Pendleton is being relegated for impeding the line of opponent, meaning she has stepped out of what's the designated sprint lane for an internal runner, rider, um, into the safe space of a passing opponent. And given the measurement that I lost by, the commissaires deemed that had that uh, collision not have happened, momentum would have carried me to the win. So in front of a full house of 6,000 Brits, the commissaires decide to relegate the British rider and Victoria Pendleton at a home games and give the win to me. And um, wow. now that was met by very, very loud boos, a lot of boos. And I just sat there with my coach, you know, headphones on, trying to reduce the noise as much as possible, talking about the next race. And the next race was important because our positions reversed. Victoria led the first one. Now I would lead the second one. And it was in the three years leading into this that we learned that Me being in front of Victoria Pendleton was the worst possible position for me to win. I needed to force Vicky into the front in every occasion, every occasion that we raced. Was this what became known as uh, No No Thy 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 Operation No Thy Enemy? Yeah, Yeah. this is fascinating. This was really cool. So No Thy Enemy isn't about knowing Victoria Pendleton. It's actually about knowing me um, through knowing my opponent. So we, we... analyzed Vicky, we broke it down to statistical data, we learned what patterns she uh, preferred, what patterns she avoided in performance and behavior on in sprint matches. And then through that knowledge, once you have information, you can then use that information to create a strategy and a skill set that's required to execute uh, a better race plan on the day. And so once we had that information, we started to focus on how we could force Victoria Pendleton to the front. A year and a half before London, we trialed it at the World Championships and when we met in the semi-final. It was the first time in six years Vicky wouldn't be world champion. It would be the first time I would be world champion based on that strategy. I didn't use that again until I met her for that second race in London a year and a half later. So we banked on the fact that her team would play the cards that they knew based off of what we were showing them as opposed to what we weren't showing them. And it just so happened to to come to fruition on race day to perfection. Um, top of turn four, I took a hard right turn. I stopped. I didn't stop as well as I did in training because I was nervous as hell. Um, but I performed the track stand or balancing the bike in a stationary position better than she did. Put her in the front, which was her weakest position and my best chance to capitalize on executing a race plan to win. And ultimately would win that second race and and come home with that gold medal, um, which I hold extremely dear and high on the accolades that I've ever achieved. Yeah, I imagine not only just because of 
where it was, but that whole process, that's a really cool process of how you figure out your, your opponent and put it into, I love that. You're knowing your We took strengths. it from the samurai, actually. We, we got Did it from really? the samurai. Yeah, yeah. Japanese that's, samurai. That's really cool. Um, mm. Yeah, knowing your own strengths is definitely a big a big thing that I think a lot of people forget. They focus either too far externally and then forget about their sort of own internal strengths that they, they hold and use them, find out more mm. about them. Don't just work mm. on your weaknesses. Absolutely. Um, with that rivalry with Victoria Pendleton, how much do you feel, how much of it was actually, because like you were saying about the media, how much of it was real? Like in the sense mm. that was it, was it as fierce as it was off the track as it was on the track or did the media um, hype it a lot more than it needed to be it's like a you said you question. were sick of it <laughs> yeah i to be honest i didn't know um and, and i've i've written a book recently and, and i actually said that you know i i did not know how vicky was going to respond to me when i got underneath the track for that medal ceremony we had barely talked um and i understand why because the tit for tat and, and competitions that we had against each other raised the two of us above above everyone and i needed her to push me in that capacity and, and i believe that we needed each other in order to be as good as we were um i thought she hated me um based off of what i'd read in the media the lack of interaction that we had had since i had um, stepped into her in a race in 2006 um and i honestly believe she she didn't like me um and, and, and I, but I just didn't know because there was occasions where odd, odd times she would talk to me. Um, and, you know, one time came um, at, a, at meal time and I nearly dropped my plate because it was so, <laughs> it was so <laughs> boring. Um, but we got a chance to talk about that with each other after Rio too, you know, and, and both of us were just so guarded to try and get through that time because it was so intense on both sides. I don't think anyone in the world other than someone who's been in a sporting rivalry to that extent would understand um, what that other person went through. And after Rio, it was almost like we could complete the 360. Like I had my 180 view of the experience and Vicky had her 180 and then we swapped it for each other mm -hmm. um, and completely changed what we knew about our own experience in that environment. Yeah. Do you think rivalries? Do you think that rivalries it was crucial for you in, Absolutely. in getting where you were? Absolutely. Do you think it's crucial for a lot of people? Do you think a lot of people have to have that rivalry? And you think it's a a healthy thing to have? Yeah, I, I do. Not everyone has an inner drive to to day in day out push themselves and themselves alone. Everyone loves to have a little carrot dangled in front of them. Um, and Vicky was mine. You know, she was the best in the world, and I wanted to be the best in the world, so I had to beat the best. Yeah. Do you think that that drive, that inner drive is learnable? Do you think you can learn it? Oh, I... There are absolutely things that you can learn. Yes, there are skill sets, you know, just as we physically employ a coach to help us improve our um, technical, tactical, physical capabilities, motor pattern skills, hand-eye coordinations, all that sort of stuff. There are coaches that can help us psychologically deal with pressure, deal with nerves make decisions um, without hesitation, um, understand emotional responses, um, all those sorts of things. And you just have to be open-minded to it. You know, mental health and psychology has this stigma. And I don't know mm. why it has this stigma, whether it's because of cinematography and what we're kind of fed through um, stereotypes um, but even in our, our communities and our um, society, it's, it's a non-accepted practice, which blows my mind because even to this day, four years retired, I still use psycho psychological coaches mm. um, because I want to be better. <laughs> mm, yeah. and, and, and I don't know the skills. I need people to, to help me with the skills in order to, to cope with life situations. So, um, yeah. I, 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 with the tools and that I teach a lot of people, a lot of athletes, I try to reframe that narrative by saying, well, you've got to look at it as mental strength. It's not necessarily yeah. your mental health, it's mental strength. So the same way you would employ a strength and conditioning coach to get your body stronger, you need to employ someone else and you need to mm. learn to, you learn how to do a squat, you learn how to do a deadlift, you learn how to run, so learn how to cycle. 
that takes a coach. It takes a coach, someone to teach you a few techniques to build your mind stronger because a lot of the stuff that you've said there is, and, and in your whole experiences are the psychological and the the um, the mental side of the game is just as input, if not more important, if you have these tools in place. Um, absolutely. That you yeah, can absolutely. Use. The hard part about um, mental strengthening um, is that you get a quicker response from physical coaching than you do mental coaching. Yeah, you know, and yeah. we can't see it, we can't measure it as easily, and it's really easy for people to give up on um, because it's a frustrating thing to have to go through. Um, but if you can persist with it, it's absolutely worth the while. I think it's a retrospective thing as well. Like you, you look back and you go, "Oh wow, I was really yeah. resilient in that moment. I was strong, and that's that's what happened." Um, I'm cautious of time, and I've just got a few few more questions. And um, one of the things that I found uh, a, a lot of times I speak to people about yourself is like, oh, "She's incredibly humble. She's incredibly grounded." It was a really cool oh, story. That's nice. Of, about yeah and and about the story of your father um giving you a, a box and it said like 3399 was it or was it was that the 33.999 33.99 three, what tell us a little bit about that story and what was in the box and when what which was it a games that you, mm. you were given it for yeah so i was leaving for the athens olympics um from home in um 2004 and I was world champion that year in the 500 meter time trial. Um, I'd written a personal best of 34.34 seconds to achieve that gold medal. Um, the Olympic record was 34.1. The world record was 34, 34.0. And no woman in the world had broken the 34 second barrier. And when I left to get on the plane, the last thing my dad gave me was a box, which I'm sure my mum bought the gift and wrapped it and wrote wrote on it, but my dad gets the credit for giving me the box. Um, it was just a, a small wrapped box with 33.999. And I looked at it and I remember curiously asking my dad, what's, what's this about? And he said, you can open that when you break the world record. And I was like, whatever, thanks, dad. Threw it in the, in the suitcase, completely forgot about it. Get to Athens. Lo and behold, first um, Olympic Games, I ride the 500 meter time trial in 33.952. So I break the world record um, to win my first gold medal. And my first thought is, oh, the box. <laughs> so me being me, you know, 20 years of age at that time, I'm like, oh, you know, maybe there's some, you know, diamond earrings in there or some perfume or you know, something like that. Um, and I eagerly ran back to my room at the village and rummaged through my suitcase looking for this little box. And I open it up. My teammates are in the room as well because they're curious what's in it. And I just keep pulling out like this magician pulling out cloth after cloth after cloth from this, this little box. And they're like, what is it? I'm like, I don't know. It's... And I open it up and I stretch it and it's a, it was just a white cloth with black edging, very simple. And on it they had embroidered, I'm a coal country kid and I'm proud to be a coal miner's daughter. And I kind of sat there and I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, this is this is a bit different. And I sat there and I thought about it and I realised that in a nutshell it was kind of their way of of me, them trying to help me recognise it didn't matter where I went, how high I aimed or what I achieved, to always remember where I came from and the people who helped me get there and who I was at the mm -hmm. nuts and bolts of it all. I was just, I'm a coal country kid. I am a coal miner's daughter. Um, and I've remembered that, I think, my my whole career and my whole life thus far i still have that little um little banner that's awesome is there it's such a good story and that's such a it totally actually makes sense how grounded you ended up staying is there any um is there any sort of anything you would say to a younger version of yourself now looking back that you would give yourself that bit of advice well you know what that's what my book is based on is that very right. Um, process I did in my psychologist's office um, because as an adult it's very hard to um, be kind to ourselves psychologically we're very quick to judge I'm very quick to judge I'm very ter I'm terrible um, critic of myself I self-analyze extensively um, and she just asked me to you know in my head get dressed in my best attire 
do my hair and my makeup and go back and knock on my my childhood home door and have my 11 year old self answer it that little girl who was inspired by watching the games on tv and she said what do you think that little girl would would say to you or think when she saw and knew what you'd achieved what would you say to her and it was really emotional because all I could do, which I had not done in my whole adult life, was just in my head get on my knees and give her a hug and say thank you because everything that she was about to go through, everything, every time she got knocked down, she, she didn't give up, um, I got a chance to thank myself. Um, so I would just encourage people to be kind and empathetic to themselves and find their own passion and um, celebrate the wins when they come because they're pretty rare. So- that kind of leads on to my my one of my last questions which is is there sort of any element of of your success that you feel is like a a fundamental um and you would say that is probably like the most important that maybe people can can take away from from all this and and maybe implement into their own their own lives whether it be sport or just everyday life yeah i think um I think what comes down to it is I, I actually listened um, to Julia Gillard, Australia's first female prime minister, once at a, at a presentation, and she said that resilience is it's like a muscle. You've got to keep using it in order for it to function at its best capacity, and she's absolutely right. Muscles work when they're used. They get stronger every time they're used. And I think for people to be resilient, because life is going to have more, more knockdowns and falls and failures than they, than they will wins, um, is to accept that fact and be prepared for when those moments come and to get through them, learn from them and be inspired by yourself getting through them in order to come out the other side better for having gone through them. That's, that's probably my best bit. Yeah. Wow. Um, look, you're now, you've, like you said, you've now got your book coming out, which is called now. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Amir's now. (laughs) And um, where people can find you on uh, animeers.com.au. You're on Twitter at animeers, Instagram at animeers. Um, What what can people expect from from the book? People can expect um, something completely different from typical sports autobiography books. This is not a book written in chronological order of I grew up here, I was born here, I got into sport here. This is a book that is based around perspective of time, hence the title now being, you know, sometimes the end of the race is just the beginning. Um, And it is an expression of my ability to articulate what I went through, what I experienced, what I learned and what I felt with perspective, not from being in the thick of it. Um, Mm. And so it is very pointed as to what moments we have shared and the relationships of people who have helped me achieve and and get through tough times. People tune in the Olympics every four years. They don't tune in the in-between. So this in-between gap is what comes out in the book. And I think it gives the ability for people to realise I'm human. That's it. Yeah. Wow. And is there anything you do now to fill that competitive edge of yours? Like, what is that? What you folk? Obviously, you, you're a, a mum. I imagine that's a a com- <laughs> not competitive, but a it's a battle. A, um, a ch- it's a battle. <laughs> it's a battle. <laughs> is, is there anything you're focusing on outside now? Now you're finished. Um, yeah, you know, I, I love my art. I um, I've gone back into painting and drawing, um, and again, that takes some skill to not be critical and self analytical. Um, uh competitively look i I draw the line at board games (laughs) right okay (laughs) (laughs) i've had my board games (laughs) (laughs) fair enough that um anna this has been amazing Uh, this has been such a a great chat and i think there's so much that people can take out of it is there i mean just finishing off is there anything you would add to want to get across to people tips or advice things that you would add in. Uh, no, look, I, I really appreciate your time and your questions. It's um, good conversations happen off the back of good questions. So well done to you. But um, I, I think the last thing that I'll say is just especially in this time where with COVID-19 and the environment that everyone's facing is if you have the capacity, um, offer someone the chance to listen, um, like be the listener. You know, often we talk um, mm-hmm. and we talk at people. We, we don't give people the chance to be listened to. And I, I think 
the world needs that at the moment. Yeah. Anna, Anna thank you so much. Um, it's been awesome. You're welcome. Thank you.